right, everyone. I am here with Jeff Gelhar. Jeff is VP of Technology and Head of AI Software Platforms at Qualcomm, as well as a great friend of the show. Jeff, welcome back to the Twimble AI Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be back, uh, I think, for our third visit. Um, give you guys an update on what we've been up to Qualcomm AI Software. Yeah, I think we'll have a great conversation. Uh, I've heard a little bit about some of the updates that uh, we've will be talking about uh, and lots of good stuff. It's been coming up on nine months or so, I guess, since the last time we spoke. And since then, we've covered a lot of interesting conversations with folks on the, the research side. Um, yep. But uh, before we jump in, I'd love to have you share a little bit about uh, your background as well as your current role at Qualcomm, which congratulations been uh, expanded a bit. Yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, to refresh uh, the audience a little bit, um, uh, rejoining the podcast, uh, Jeff Calhar, VP Technology. Look, my role um, right now is really about um, expanding and enhancing Qualcomm's investment in software for AI across our whole portfolio. The expanded role is really to include the cloud AIC 100 product line as part of that. And so we could talk maybe a bit about how we're looking to harmonize our AI stack across our whole portfolio. And as a bit of a background, um, I uh, spent a long period of time in, in what's now Qualcomm AI Research. You, you spoke to one of my colleagues on that side uh, recently, um, but happy to be partnering really closely with Qualcomm AI Research to take their ideas and put them in the software and working, of course, with our hardware teams around our complete AI software solutions. Uh, so you mentioned the Cloud AI 100 uh, and that portfolio of, of products. We've talked about it uh, a little bit on the show previously, but um, kind of give us a refresher and share a little bit about the you know current updates there. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So that, the AIC 100 is a product um, designed for cloud edge applications. So data center applications, uh, smart cities, um, you, know, you can think about videos, surveillance kinds of applications, uh, autonomous robots. Um, we're using that everywhere from, from our automated driving program all the way up into you know, cloud inference infrastructure kinds of applications to power very high end, you know, hundreds of tops kinds of applications. And when put in a rack, uh, I think Ziad made a joke about, uh, you know, uh, peta ops kind of uh, class applications. So we've got quite a range of compute available in that device. And then we're using that in conjunction with our, let's say more traditional Snapdragon processors um, to power a whole range of smart city robotics and autonomous devices, include in addition to our cloud edge kinds of use cases. Awesome. So one of the topics that I wanted us to dig into a bit is uh, on ML compilers, yeah. which is uh, an increasingly uh, kind of interesting and hot topic with projects the likes of Glow out of Facebook and uh, TVM. Um, let's start by having you kind of introduce us to the, the concept broadly and what's the role of ML compilers compared to uh, some of the other types of technologies that you know, we've seen like Onyx and, and others. Yeah, great. So we think when we think of compilers at Qualcomm, we think of it in the broadest set of the words. So let me define that a little bit. We we're thinking about the whole problem of compilation. And typically when we think about a compiler, a C++ compiler, we think we have a high level language and somebody writes an algorithm in it and we want to reduce that to, you know, machine code. And of course, we have really good compilers like LVM that do that. When we think about a neural network, analogy holds. I've got a neural network. I want to, uh, you know, bring it in wherever I bring it in from PyTorch, TensorFlow. We'll talk about Onyx in a second, and I want to compile it, you know, in a sense. Now, in some cases, the hardest part of that problem is figuring out all of the parallelism that's going on inside of that neural network, right? So, in a sort of standard, sort of feed-forward kind of neural network. Um, there's a lot of things you could do in parallel. And so the area where we make, we're making a big investment is in that, I'll call it scheduling and tiling part of the problem. How do you deploy this 
uh, compiler technology in a way that your neural network is mapped to hardware in a highly efficient way. The traditional code generation piece, back end of it, is also a challenging piece in its own right. Generating highly performant code to produce, you know, what we'll call neural network ops. You know, fragments of code that represent the actual work being done in a neural network. In addition to getting those tiled and deployed correctly onto the hardware is a pretty tricky operation. And so in the case of the AIC product, we're largely leveraging work that Facebook started with the Glow infrastructure. And we've done a lot of customization and optimization uh, in what I'll call the back end of the compiler, the part of the compiler that deals with that scheduling, tiling, and code generation piece. And we're also more towards our Snapdragon portfolio working with the TVM community to do a similar kind of thing, more on the sort of single core, you know, mobile IOT kind of devices around whole graph compilation of taking in a graph, solving that tiling and scheduling problem, and then deploying it, you know, onto our hardware. Can you, uh, can yeah. you maybe give a, a little bit more concrete detail that illustrates the difference between the tiling, you know, what kind of operations would be covered by tiling versus the code generation part? Yeah, so when I say tiling, and there's a lot of different sort of ways to slice this, uh, this problem, mm -hmm. I'm really thinking about the problem of how do I do things like take my tensors, break them up into pieces so that I can parallelize parts of the operation. How do I make those tensors fit into blocks of memory that I have in ways where those blocks are packed into memory efficiently, they're stored in local memory, you know, a correct amount of time. So I'm using my local memory really efficiently. I'm being um, efficient about um, when I go to DDR, when I don't go to DDR, how do I bring in data for the neural network? How do I send the results, you know, to the next stage of processing? And all the parallelism, these are highly parallel machines, especially when we talk about AIC 100, it's a highly parallel machine. Just solving that problem of parallelism is a big part of the ML compiler job. The code generation is really about, once I've solved that problem, like I've taken my data and I've kind of chopped it into pieces and I figured out how to parallelize it and I figured out what has to happen first, just generating the code to do that is kind of what I'll call the code generation piece. So whether it's the, code for that you know the, that pipeline i've just kind of figured out or it's the actual code of the kernels i've actually got to make it run on the hardware right so at the end yeah. i've got to take that schedule i got to link it with code and i got to deploy that onto you know a set of cores to execute the workload and that's really in the broadest sense what we think of when we say a qualcomm when we think of when we say compilers got it got it so the the if thinking about it from the kind of the graph that the developers created yeah. down the um the code generation kind of looks at the graph and turns that into code and the tiling is more the low level data structure and it's closer no. to the hardware other way around so so it, it you think of the tiling as the 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 part where i'm taking the the neural network and in the most naive way i would just sort of execute it as specified by the you know, by the data scientist, but to get maximum performance, I want to be really, um, we want to be really efficient about how we're using memory and how big those memory blocks are. And I want to break operations that I can make parallel into smaller parallel operations and do them all at the same time on a parallel machine. The code generation is really the very last stage. Like once I've decided that whole, um, recipe, if you will, for execution, what are the actual instructions I have to give my hardware to do that? Right? Got it. Got it's it. really that figuring out the puzzle. I have a giant neural network. How do I efficiently, you know, order the instructions so that it produces the correct semantic results, but so that it's as optimal on the hardware as possible. And every one of the custom accelerators in the market has picked a different architecture. So they have a slightly different optimization problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, is there on that note? Is there, yeah, you know, how do you think about the AIC 100 architecture from a, you know, principles perspective relative to other approaches that are out on the market? What's different about it? 
Well, of course, I can't share a ton of details, but I'll say it, it, it's a it's a leverages our um, our traditional focus on high performance and low power. Um, I think Ziad shared a lot of metrics at a high level about that uh, when he was on the show with you and your audience. And um, and the way I think about it is that other devices in the market, I think, have picked very large arrays to solve their problem. And I would say about this is we picked a more kind of finer grained, highly parallel architecture, right? And uh, therefore we can take advantage of the parallelism that exists uh, sort of naturally in, in some of these core, in some of these neural networks, I'm sorry, and deploy them onto the hardware in a really efficient way. And so one of the sort of evidences of that, and we did quite well in the, the recent ML Commons uh, benchmarks uh, around our ASC 100 product. And so the audience can go see those results and see that we, you know, best in class results in a number of categories, uh, mm -hmm. deploying this exact stack, bring in a neural network, you know, figure out how to tile and deploy it to hardware and then get very good power performance out of the solution. Got it. Got it. And from a, a software perspective, are there uh, differences in the architecture or approach of Glow and TVM that led to Glow being the preferred route for the cloud inference solution and TVM being the preferred route uh, for the devices? Or is that more market based? I'd say it's a bit of market and a bit of technology, uh, to be fair. Um, the um, Glow, I think, was designed from from the beginning with these large cloud workloads in mind, and we had in mind to build this large, you know, cloud oriented array. And I think maybe a little bit later we discovered, wow, this is a really cool device. We can actually apply it to all kinds of things besides, you know, cloud and edge. And, and so we had started down that road, and we started at a time when compilers were, I think, still a little nascent for applications of comp actually compiling. ML uh, kernels. A lot of um, a lot of companies have written a lot of handwritten code. Um, Arm and other companies, you know, write a lot of kernels and optimize them for their hardware. And so, a little bit of the market forces is that there's a you know maybe these are the two big contenders for ML compilers today, apart from maybe for some proprietary offerings. Um, and so it is a bit of a horse race. It's a, still early, I think, as we've discussed yeah. before in the ML compiler space, although it's sort of crystallizing a bit more as people understand the problems better. And so that's a little bit why also Qualcomm kind of is looking at both because um, because we feel like there's elements of both that are very strong and we want to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we've talked about some of your support for tiny ml and mm -hmm. work that you've done with google uh is that um to what degree does that relate to this compiler conversation we've been having so um it's a, it's in a space that um that um we are invested in we've got a tiny ml work with google and there is a tiny tvm effort okay. uh, and so we're looking at we're looking at that space as well for the super deeply embedded always on kind of use cases and it's, um, you know, it's a smaller part of our overall portfolio, but we're definitely, you know, looking at that as well. Got it. So the, the, I guess the way to think about it is you've got the kind of cloud class, large scale infrastructure devices, that's AIC 100 and you're using Glow as the compiler there. You've got the handheld devices um, that are still, you know, relatively full featured and powerful yeah. and TVM is the approach there. And then tiny ML is more for these, um, you know, smaller footprint, more constrained, always on devices and tiny TVM is uh, an offshoot that is going to provide that same set of compiling capability uh, for those devices. Yeah, it's a great way to summarize it. Absolutely. Uh, and then to to close the loop, I mentioned Onyx earlier. Onyx isn't exactly a compiler, is it? No, no. So so we were involved very early in the Onyx, uh, you know, standards uh, establishment, if you will, sort of de facto standard. Uh, we chaired part of the Onyx Edge working group for a good period of time, um, and so Onyx is is kind of gone in kind of maybe two ways. 
we still use it very extensively as an interchange format. So mm -hmm. our tools can read Onyx files that are exported, let's say from PyTorch. And frequently our customers bring us those kinds of models and we work with them um, to, to you know, deploy them onto our silicon. And there's also an Onyx runtime, right? So Onyx runtime has been started to be integrated into places like uh, WinML in the Microsoft stack and in some of the data center applications as well. And so we've got work going on uh, to bring Onyx as a runtime on top of our underlying APIs uh, into our portfolio as well. So we think of Onyx as, like you said, not a compiler, but as a data interchange format and yeah. as a sort of execution framework um, that, that can sit sort of on top of our silicon. Yeah, I kind of think of it as like a CSV file for yeah. spreadsheets. You know, yeah. uh, TensorFlow might be Excel and PyTorch might be pages and yeah. you can still interchange the um, interchange data using the CSV format, similar to that. Um, but I wasn't familiar with the, the runtime uh, effort. That sounds pretty interesting. So think about it. There's, you know, when we think about it and talk about it in a little bit, but um, we, we're providing a set of APIs across our whole platform with this, you know, as we sort of harmonize our offering. And what we then find is that there are a number of different what I'll call sort of execution frameworks that various markets or various customers want to use. So in some markets, they want to use TF Lite. We think of that like an execution framework. TF Lite can accelerate on our hardware for very good experiences. And um, in some markets, that, like in the Windows market, uh, Microsoft has established WinML, Android, uh, Google has established Android neural networks. These are all execution frameworks, if you will, that can read neural networks, can orchestrate their execution on the hardware and do so with our underlying drivers. And we could talk a little bit about that. That's part of why we did AI Engine Direct um, in order to provide best in class acceleration in a package that can then be exposed to the ecosystem along a number of different routes. And Onyx Runtime is one of those kinds of, of routes. So Onyx Runtime orchestrates the deployment of the network and we provide libraries that accelerate that on our hardware is the way to think about it. Got it, got it. Uh, so you mentioned the platform, what's new in the on the platform front at Qualcomm? Oh my gosh, so much stuff. So with um, a couple different things going on. So with the um, announcement of the Snapdragon 888, we announced the uh, AI Engine Direct, which is a evolution on the, um, the Hexagon and, and N Direct we had announced in the previous generation product. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea there is, um, is we realized that there was this um, diversity of routes that our customers wanted to use to get on the platform. We just talked about TF Lite and Android neural networks and so on. And we realized that the key, kind of biggest innovation we can provide is, is linking that compiler discussion we had earlier, this tiling and deployment thing, which is very hard to do and, and, and it's unique to our hardware and provide a bridge to these execution frameworks. So this AI Engine Direct is sort of a mid-level API that's consistent across, it will be consistent across all of our product offerings um, as we move forward but starting with the Snapdragon portfolio of products. And that API can then be used um, above that API. You can write an orchestration layer like a TF Lite or like an Onyx runtime. And below that API, um, we provide best in class hardware acceleration across our IP blocks. Um, and the advantage to the developer is a common API so they can you know, talk to our hardware, whether they want to talk to a GPU or they want to talk to HTP, they can talk to our hardware with a common API. It's on us to provide best in class scheduling and tiling and acceleration. And then they can build their application kind of however they want. Now we're going to take that and we're going to extend that concept over to the AIC product so that you will have a kind of horizontal experience, regardless of where you want to use a Qualcomm piece of silicon in your product, you will have a common way of accessing our APIs. And if you want to use, you know, common orchestration, like an Onyx runtime, you can then build on top of that. And of course, we'll partner with, you know, industry partners to make that 
you know, smooth and seamless. So we're really trying to open up our portfolio, um, mm -hmm. but provide best in class sort of hardware and software acceleration at the low level, and then really provide kind of choice as you go up the stack, depending on what your application needs are. Got it. And as you bring more capability to the platform, are you seeing a shift in the types of developers that are accessing your APIs? Meaning is it shifting from kind of the, the device manufacturers and OEMs to the end developers at all? Yeah, it depends a little on market segment, right? So in, uh, in uh, like our traditional smartphone segment, we still work very, very closely with the big names you'd be familiar with. And in those areas, you know, we, you know, you and I often talk about what are the use cases, you know, we, we mm -hmm. work with them, I think in the last generation, you know, well over a hundred different models or we work with them to deploy and optimize. Obviously different OEMs have different combinations, but it's not unusual for, you know, our flagship devices with our partners to have 50, 60, 70 neural networks, maybe in a single device. And these and so, are models that are provided, you know, via the operating system for things like facial recognition and, you know, photography, for yeah. example, lots of things. Yeah. So fingerprint anywhere from unlocking your device. So face unlock, mm -hmm. fingerprint, right? These are biometric, secure, secure payments, um, you know, camera, nighttime photography, um, some of the cinemagraphic effects. Um, you know, face detect, face tracking, subject tracking, um, super resolution, right? So this idea that you can take like a lower res sensor and create, uh, the, you know, the appearance, the effect of a high res sensor. Mm -hmm. um, these are all little secrets that your smartphone does for you. And they're cool. And maybe you take them for granted. But behind there, you know, one frame might be processed by 10 or 15 different neural networks that are each providing you know, one layer in that one is going to you know, remove noise. Another one is going to improve the sharpness. Another one is going to, you know, deal with nighttime lighting and so on. Mm -hmm. And the composite effect of these incredible, you know, photos that we see coming out of our devices, right? They say the best camera you have is the ones in your pocket. And in a lot of cases, um, while I'm a photographer and, and I like my, you know, cameras, uh, the one I always have is my smartphone. Right. 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 Um, and so we, but we see that in audio processing, you know, mic, uh, noise suppression, uh, and so on, right? And when you look at segments like compute, you and I are using some kind of, you know, laptop or computer, um, you know, making like the video conferencing experience better in this, you know, new work world. These are things that we're, gonna, we're doing already with our partners using AI uh, on our silicon. And, you know, in these kind of platform environments, you often see the, you know, the platforms provide higher and higher level of abstraction uh, capability. I'm curious if you can comment on this at all. Just uh, initially, you know, the, the large vendors whose name we all know, like yeah. they had a distinct advantage in, you know, their phones because they, they had the, the ML chops to make their cameras do amazing things. I'm imagining a world in which, you know, as opposed to them just relying on, you know, great APIs and hardware uh, to make that happen and proprietary models, you, know, you can start to offer, um, you know, a night vision model built into the platform. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, and that's just an example, but I'm curious the extent to which that's happening today, the extent to which you, you foresee that in the future. Uh, anything you can share on that? Well, so it's a complicated question because um, <laughs> because in the following sense, it used to be that 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 the things that made these cameras great were people who were really good at cameras, and of course we still have those people. But it was a algorithmically solved, you know, traditionally solved problem, and now these neural networks are really the IP that these OEMs, camera vendors, you know, whatever the application is, whether you're automotive uh autonomous driving and it's important to do segmentation and you know pedestrian detection and sign detection whatever that use case is the model is now the sort of ip uh that's mm -hmm. so valuable right to the end to the end uh, uh oem whatever you're building whatever your product is and so 
let me do it, turning that around. I will say that we use the same tools and the same innovation inside of, let's say, Qualcomm's camera pipeline, Qualcomm's audio pipeline. Right. So I can't speculate uh, with the audience on, you know, whether we would introduce a, you know, face beautification model or a, you know, relighting model as part of our end to end camera offering, except to say that we use the same kind of techniques to improve our camera pipeline. And some of that stuff is baked in. And then some of it, the OEMs come to us and say, no, 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 we have a proprietary solution we think is a differentiator. And we want your help to get it on and get it into our products. And so we respect the fact that our OEMs, whether we're talking about a handset OEM or a IoT or an automotive developer, that that's part of the value that they're offering to their to their customer on top of our silicon. So we want to be you know mindful of that, respectful of that. And so sure, we'll bring certain innovations to the market through our channels and with partners, but we want to be respectful of you know, the fact that our customers want to build their own IP and differentiate on it, right? So we want to be an accessible platform for that innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about benchmarking in the context of the AIC 100. Are there also benchmarking uh, results that you're doing in the context of the platform? Yeah, so so broad, more broadly, um, and and maybe in a more established sort of way, there are a number of AI benchmarks. Uh, there's been some early benchmarks, and then more and more interest from the traditional benchmark developers. I'm sure your audience is familiar with the geek benches of the world, and when they last bought a PC, they probably looked at you know a spec mark or a geek bench and looked at specs. And so by similar, some of those traditional benchmark vendors are doing now AI benchmarks mm -hmm. and there's some new entrants. And so we very actively participate in that on the mobile side, our Snapdragon portfolio. So whether it's, um, it's Ludashi, very popular, um, sort of AI benchmark in China, um, whether it's, uh, benchmarks oriented, oriented around, um, like, Android neural networks, there's a few Android neural network benchmarks. And getting back to MLPerf, we also participate in the MLPerf benchmarks that are mobile oriented. So MLPerf has a whole categorization of benchmarks. They expect, of course, that a benchmark for a mobile device is not going to be competing with a benchmark in the cloud market. So there are segments of benchmarks in MLPerf. Yep. And we're very active participants there. Now, one thing that I wanted to maybe highlight get back to when you were asking about the platform um this was announced at google io and it ties in with the kind of idea around benchmarks is we're working with google have announced that we will be working with them on these updatable drivers for android and so the way that ties with benchmarks is that you know we release a device and it has hardware in it and we talked early in the conversation about compilers and about tiling and about optimization, these are not solved problems. I mean, we're doing some really interesting, innovative work in the compiler tiling algorithm development area. And so as our customers bring use cases, as we continue to innovate, we find that we can make marked improvements in the performance of these platforms through software. You know, We can find better ways to schedule these graphs onto the hardware. And so we do that. And in many of our products, like our Snapdragon Neural Processing SDK, I'll call it our, our oldest, most established SDK, we make monthly releases to, uh, to the marketplace and to our customers. Um, but this often requires them to make a product refresh, like update the ROM, you know, issue a new app, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The work with Google will actually allow us to make updates working with Google directly to the end device um, to have sort of continuous improvement on Snapdragon with these updates. So the tie back to benchmarks is people like to say, oh, I, I had this snapshot in time. I did this benchmark and I got this score. I got like 800 and it was amazing. Right. And it's great. And then, you know, three months later, four months later, six months later, that score is 900. And people are like, well, one second, you didn't change the hardware. And it's like, yeah, but we're continually updating these algorithms that tile and schedule and make improvements. And being able to update the marketplace as fast as AI is changing. So you don't need to go get a new phone. You can actually get an update that's going to make your phone work better. That's really where we want to push also, right? Make our product cycles kind of match as best we can, of course, the rate of innovation that we see happening 
in the AI space in a general sense. And so these, you know, improvements that we're doing lead to improvements in benchmarks, improvements in end user experience, and also, you know, give us a chance to work with partners like Google to, you know, find ways to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Related to the topic of uh, performance and, uh, you know, somewhat related to the, the topic of compilers. Uh, when we spoke last, we talked about uh, quite a bit about quantization uh -huh. and the AIMIT toolkit and some of the work that uh, you're doing there. It's one of the areas I often talk to Qualcomm researchers about compression and, yeah. and and uh, quantization. And it's one of the areas there seems to be a free flowing pipeline of innovation from research into product. Can you give us an update on uh, on that? Sure, absolutely. So again, we talked a little bit, had a short update in our um, tech summit uh, at the end of the year on, around Snapdragon 888. Um, as you mentioned, there's a sort of continuous innovation happening. And this is really a good example of one of many, but a good example where we're closely partnering with our colleagues in Qualcomm Research and, and trying to, you know, make those ideas that you hear from Amir and from others maybe on the podcast mm -hmm. over into um, into the product. So the update there is um, that's part of my expanded role. We'll be um, taking on the you know full commercialization of these tools. We'll be integrating them as part of this if you will harmonization of our full stack um, that will include being able to bring in, you know, quantization results from tools like AMIT. It won't be the only tool. We will still accept, of course, PyTorch and TensorFlow. But to complement that, and we think to advance sort of state of the art in quantization, um, the techniques that are in AMIT that are published by the research group, many of them are made available in open source. Some of them are. We are going to have a sort of pro version of, of AMIT that'll go out to our customers that will be you know, scaled up and it'll be sort of impedance matched to the roadmap of the hardware and the software that we're developing in the overall product portfolio so that we can continue to assist our customers in getting best in class performance, power performance on our hardware in a way that, um, that allows them to take advantage of our optimized hardware at these lower bit rates, right? Getting to lower bit rates, as you've probably heard, is not always a straightforward thing and it's an area where we partner with our customers to get right um, but by making sure that we've got tools that can do compression that can do things like eight around uh, right this is statistical rounding technique to improve accuracy for these bit rates um, as we do that as we do other things uh, in the future that improve um, on our tooling you'll see more and more of these things you know hopefully fit together and in that area we are um we're really, you know, we're really trying to harmonize that to, to, again, reduce the friction. They asked about developers and whether it's just the OEMs, reduce the friction so that more and more, um, you know, less and less, you know, data scientists and more and more developers can do this for themselves yeah. and can get the advantage of it. So that's really where we're going uh, with that. So keep, stay tuned, have the audience should stay tuned as we do that. Um, we're already engaged with our partners. Many of our partners have already uh you know basically aim it pro and they're using it and they're giving us feedback uh on it uh but that will become more and more a mainstay of our of our products uh, as we move forward and can you speak to the you know maybe the most promising or, or most recent um techniques that have been incorporated into aim it pro for quantization and um you know what they what they offer from a relative performance perspective or you know how you think about that landscape yeah so so we so the 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 little secret here is that tricks that are in amet and amet pro have been shipping in our products for a while so the um some of our best quantization techniques we kind of snuck into the product like 18 months ago before we had sort of a a toolkit sort of fully identified. So some of uh, the, what you see in the marketplace already takes advantage of those uh, techniques. But you techniques you build a network that's in the product and you've used these quantization techniques in that network. The tool is to allow other folks who are building their own networks to achieve the same things. Y yes, both. So both 
networks we've developed that have used it, but also before it really had a product name, we were already taking these techniques, putting them into tools like our Snapdragon Neural Processing SDK, wow. and they were shipping out to customers. So your, if I can say your, you know, Galaxy device already leverages some of those techniques and it has for a period of time. We're now creating a more, say, well-defined product around it, and we're adding more techniques. So exciting techniques are kind of two things. In the area of, of things like quantization, this eight around thing we keep coming back to is a very interesting uh, idea of, uh, of sort of stochastically rounding up or rounding down and playing with that um, decision. Turns out to have a really interesting effect on quantization, a positive effect on quantization. Um, the other thing I think is important and maybe a little subtle to the audience is when you're doing, for example, quantization of our training, right? So this is a training technique where you're, you're training the network in the face of quantization or quantization noise so that it's becoming, if you will, familiarized uh, with the effects of quantization. So when you actually move to quantize the network, it's already kind of aware of what the consequences are. It's been trained in the face of that environment. The better you can do that in a way that's aware of how the network will actually be deployed on the hardware, what we like to call hardware aware quantization uh, aware training. That's a mouthful. We probably uh -huh. should have a better name. Um, <laughs> but the idea being, if I know not just that the network will be quantized, and I train it in the face of that. But I, if I can make those techniques aware of what it'll actually look like on the hardware, so the more I can move the training part of the problem closer to the hardware, the better my results are going to be. And we're just starting to see some of that. And we've got some ideas in the pipeline about how we can do that in a better way. So the sort of longer term and maybe in another nine months or whatever, I can come back and maybe we'll be ready to share some more is closing that loop as a hardware manufacturer, as a developer of these you know, software toolkits and as a research innovator, I feel like we really have the three main elements here where we can close that loop. And the more that our tools are aware of how it goes on to hardware and therefore by consequence, longer term, how we can change the hardware in ways that it makes it easier to close that loop. We really have a virtuous cycle and you're, we're going to start to see some of those loops close. And that to me is one of the most exciting things about, about that toolkit, right? Is being able to fully close that loop. Yeah, when you talk about closing that loop, what what exactly does that mean? I'm imagining, you know, trying to, you know, taking decades to train a transformer on a uh, a device. <laughs> no, no, no. So closing that loop is more. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Closing that loop, in my mind, is more about, um, for example, um, making sure that the simulated quantization that's happening during the training, during let's say a quantization or a training pass, that that is. I'll call it hardware aware. It's aware of some of the eccentricities that a particular piece of hardware might, uh, you know, impact. So it's kind of greater fidelity between the device right. environment and the training environment, exactly. not necessarily training on device literally. Right. right. Although we can talk about that too, but in this case, I'm really talking about that, that there's fidelity and that they're complementary. They're aware of the eccentricities, if you will, yeah. of both environments in a way that we can kind of leverage that eccentricity for benefit. Got it. Got it. And then uh, you mentioned we can talk about training on device. That, that, is that in the context of like a federated type of uh, environment? We've talked briefly about that in the past yeah. and, and have talked about it from a research perspective. Any any updates there in particular? Yeah. So the, you know, it's a research group has uh, been busy at it since we talked last. And um, and while I can't really talk about specific applications that we're not ready to unveil that, done a lot of research, we've got uh, labs up and running. Um, by labs, I mean, you know, to do this, you have to simulate real and virtual devices at some scale to understand, you know, how to federate learning and what the trade-offs are. And of course, we're first and foremost, a wireless communications company. So this becomes really natural. We often have to simulate large numbers of users mm -hmm. at scale that have unreliable radio links and so on. So this is perfect. We're just now doing it with federated learning in addition to the communication link. 
And I think you heard Ziad in a previous podcast. Uh, and those of you who didn't listen, please go back and listen to my colleague Ziad talk about, you know, 5G and AI being complementary. And this is a great example right. of where, you know, we know a lot about the link. We know a lot about the fidelity and infidelity, as you know, uh, the robustness of the link. And when you're doing federated learning, of course, you have to factor in that you might have somebody in your federation that goes away because their battery dies or the call goes away or they drive into a parking lot or who knows why. And, but statistically you need a certain number of samples and so on. And the applications here are really about things that are amenable to crowdsourcing in a general sense. So data sets, whether it's, I think, I think Zia talked about, uh, you know, Google keyboard, but generalizing that data sets where the experience of a large number of users improves the whole for everybody is kind of what we have in mind. And we don't have in mind, start with brass tacks and like you said, train a transformer, you know, large language scale transformer on devices that would take an eternity perhaps. But can we start with a, if you will, a lab train, cloud train model, deploy it to a number of devices, right? It's in every shipping Galaxy device, maybe, or something, right? And can the experiences of the users collectively improve because their environment, the experiences that they and their device go through are all different or largely different, right? And this can be for sound detection. This could be for maybe wake word improvement. This could be for, you know, sensor modalities, right? And so when we talk about the life cycle of a device, each of our devices goes through different life cycles, but we can, you know, group those experiences and have a better, you know, collective outcome. And so we're looking yeah. at the infrastructure and frameworks for that. And then also some use cases kind of in that direction where we think that this technology is really complementary to improve user experiences by, if you will, fine tuning models uh, around those experiences. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jeff, uh, it is always a pleasure to chat with you and uh, appreciate the updates as always. Um, wonderful to have you on the show. Well, thank you very much. Really enjoy it. Um, I, thank you for having me and, uh, and a great conversation about all these exciting things we're doing and come back the next time and give you and yet another update. Awesome. And I should mention that we have uh, mentioned uh, several other conversations uh, with Ziad and, and some of the researchers, and we'll have related links on the show notes page so uh, folks can check them all out. Uh, Jeff, thank you. Thank you. You have a good afternoon. I do.